Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes. We're gonna let everybody get into the webinar. Give it just one more minute and then we'll get started. And I, oh, there he goes. Making sure my husband is shutting the door because Ryan went in there to turn on the TV, so. <laughs> <laughs> I turned it down. <laughs> Not that one. Not their head. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to our Homeschooling 101 webinar, how you can homeschool your child with PWS. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight, Julie Casey and Danielle Warmoth. Julie has been homeschooling her son, Ryan, who is 17, for the last 11 years. This September, she will begin her 12th year with Ryan as a high school senior. Before becoming a stay-at-home mom, Julie, who, owns a, who holds a BA in behavioral sciences and an MA in organizational management, worked in the insurance and risk management industry. Shortly after Ryan was born in 2004, Julie got involved with both PWSA USA and PWCF. She is a past board president for PWCF and remains on their fund development committee. Julie is a member of the PWSA USA Communications and Editorial Committee, the Chapter Relations Committee, and is a parent mentor for PWSA USA. Danielle has been homeschooling for 21 years and has three children, ages 30, 27, and Andrew, who is 14 with PWS. She served as secretary for prader willi Syndrome, Indiana's chapter for 10 years. She is a multidisciplinary major in international studies from Michigan State University, holds minors in earth science, archaeology, and anthropology, and speaks French and Japanese. Danielle retired from the airlines in 2012 to stay home with Andrew. Together, they co-authored the website Moving Mountains Daily. It was a homeschool project that grew way beyond what they intended. Outside the classroom, exercise and life adventures are a big part of their school day. Experiences like hospital stays, learning to pump gas, scouting, living with the nomads in Mongolia, or watching a flat boat navigate the Ohio River locks all count as school. Their family life motto is progress, not perfection. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. What I'm going to do, get started here. So this is basically what um, Stacy just read. So I'll leave, skip through that. So today we've got three goals for you. Our first goal is to assure you that homeschooling actually is possible. Um, number two is to provide you with an overview of homeschooling. And number three is to answer your questions. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time on number two, which will hopefully um, accomplish number one. And then we're going to leave a lot of time for number three. So uh, a big question I think right now um, is what's the difference between homeschooling and distance learning, right? Because, you know, 18 months ago, uh, lots of people were thrown into um, schooling at home. Um, but there is a difference. Um, and hopefully Danielle is nodding in the, <laughs> in the window there. So distance learning is fully dictated by the school. Um, homeschooling is controlled by the parent. So a lot of people, I heard a lot of people last year um, start to say, oh, now, now we're homeschooling, everybody's homeschooling. And I'm like, mm, not really. Um, cause what we do as homeschoolers is really different than what you guys may be doing as distance learners. Um, 
So do you have anything to add to that, Danielle? Um, I, I, yeah, it just, it varies by family. So let's talk about the different ways to homeschool. So generally speaking, there's three ways. Uh, we're, so we're going to uh, pop up here on the screen from the most restrictive to the least restrictive. So the most restricted is going through your school district. Some school districts actually offer a homeschool program. It's known as the independent study program. The students are still public school students and they have to follow all the district rules. But the plus side is you have some flexibility since the schooling is taking place at home. So you're not bound by, you know, an eight o'clock bell schedule. Um, so that's the most restrictive way. Next, you've got through a virtual charter school. Technically speaking, this is still a public school too. And if you actually read the agreement on these, it will say it's an independent study program through whatever school district is hosting that charter school. But you have even more flexibility than you do with option number one, because generally um, the virtual schools, virtual charter schools will give you choices in curriculum. Um, there are some that are set where you have to follow all of their curriculum, but many have that flexibility where you can choose. So you don't have to, to take this math um, curriculum. You can choose, you know, out of hundreds of math curriculums. So there is more flexibility. And again, you have that same flexibility you have with number one of schools taking place at home. So you get to control times and accommodations and things like that. And then the third way, is independently. And that would be where you have the most flexibility and the most choices because you really you control pretty much everything. And I say pretty much everything because the, the requirements do vary by state. So each state sets um, the requirements for homeschoolers. I will also throw in here that some people consider number one and two not homeschooling because again, the students are technically public school students. I take a more um, broad approach to homeschooling and consider if you're doing it at home and you're the one who's in charge, even if you have rules to follow from an outside source, you're still homeschooling. Um, so it kind of depends on where you fall on that spectrum of how strict. Danielle, have you come across that same thing where you've got some people who are like, oh no, that's not homeschooling. Yeah, um, I, I like what you said about how homeschooling differs um, between states, even if you're independently. Um, I'm Indiana is a free homeschool state. I My school district, unless I involve them, doesn't know we even exist. But I'm a mile over the Ohio border and all our homeschool friends in Ohio kind of have to what I call jump through hoops. And um, they have to register with their local schools and they have to show what curriculum they're going to use and what their intents are. And all I have to do is take attendance. And I don't know that I've ever even had anybody ask me about that. So every state's very different. Um, with the virtual charter schools, I really don't have, have any information on the other alternatives. So next, we get this question a lot. Um, don't you have to be a teacher to homeschool? You know, when I started homeschooling, people said, oh, so you're a teacher. I'm like, no, I'm not a teacher. And you don't have to be a teacher to homeschool. Um, most states have no specific requirement to homeschool your own children. So you don't have to be a teacher. Um, some do require that you have a high school diploma or a GED. But even those states generally offer some sort of an exception. And Washington State is actually the one that um, has the most requirements for your qualifications as, as the teacher. But they even offer several different um, options to meet those. And as Danielle mentioned, each state is very different. Um, you can find out the exact requirements for your state at this website, which I believe Danielle already put in the chat for you. Um, I will say this website is a Christian-based organization. So that's my disclaimer if you're not of the Christian faith. Um, 
but it is excellent information, um, particularly where they talk about the requirements for each state. They do a really good job of summarizing it, which is why I refer people there, even my Jewish friends, I will refer them to that because it's a, it's a good um, resource. I think all homeschoolers start there, Christian or non-Christian. They're just, exactly. the, the word legal is really helpful if you have problems with your school district or um, problems in general with homeschooling, they're there to help. So it's a really good, that website's a really good um, starting place. And then, mm -hmm. If you also, well, I think on that same, on their website, when they talk about um, each state, the requirements for each state, I think there's a lot of the states will have a listing for that state's um, organization. Like in California, we have two different um, statewide organizations that um, help homeschoolers. So those are always good places to, to look for the requirements for your state as well. So now we've established that yes, you can homeschool your, your child, even though you're not a teacher. But you're saying, but really, can I teach my own child? So here's a couple of tips on that. Um, this is something that I did um, when I started, because we started when Ryan was in first grade. I created a teacher persona um, that kind of separated mom from teacher. And I was known as Mrs. Jack, which is my initials. And I would come in in the morning when we start classes and I would say, hi, Ryan, how are you doing? And after Christmas break, you know, I would say, hey, how was your break? Now, of course I knew how his break was, but I played that persona. Um, so that's one way to sort of, you know, break that mold. Um, engage your child in the process. Let them help make some of the decisions. Obviously the older they get, the easier that is. Um, but even young kids, you can, you know, what story do you want to read today? Um, you can include them in as much choices as is age appropriate. Everybody likes to have control in things, so let them help. And this last uh, kind of tip is to relax and have fun. And uh, trust me, I am a very type A personality. So this I know is a lot easier said than done. But I have learned through the years that if you're calm, your child will be more relaxed. And learning doesn't have to be boring. It shouldn't be hard. We're used to thinking that school has to be done, you know, from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, and look a certain way. But the truth is it can look however you want. You can spend your day at museums, at the park, taking nature walks, reading books. Um, in Danielle's introduction, um, Stacy mentioned a bunch of things that Danielle and her son did, or actually all your kids, I think. Um, there's lots of ways to learn. Um, do you have any other tips, Danielle, to add on being able um, to act, teach your child? Homeschooling is geared towards um, the specific child. So it might be easier to not do school at a desk and to take it outside and to do it at the kitchen table. It doesn't have to look like a schoolroom. Um, during COVID, when all the schools shut down and the kids were all off of school, we weren't off school, but we took, instead of locking down, we went out to the river. I mean, we found sandbars that, where we were isolated and that led to finding an Indian artifact that led to um, reading ancient newspapers about our area. So it took us into history. And from then on, from there on out, this Native American unit just took a life of its own. And I have an entire garage full of artifacts right now. So <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be at a desk. And we learned more in that unit. I mean, we still are. It's just kind of an ongoing thing. So now the next question you might be asking is, can I still have an IEP and get services? Because of course this is PWSA USA, right? We're parents who have kids with special needs. We needed those IEPs. So the short answer is yes. Um, and here's a couple of ways to do that. One uh, is through your local school district. Um, and we'll go back, I'm gonna reference back to what I said about the ways to homeschool. If you're doing an independent study program, through your actual school district, your IEP is gonna look almost identical. You're gonna have some accommodations 
um, that won't be needed because the environment's different, but otherwise your IEP will look pretty much the same. If you're going through a virtual charter school, as we mentioned before, these are technically public schools. So yes, they have to provide an IEP the same as your local school district. Um, and again, it might look a little bit different than your, you know, what you're used to in your, your traditional brick and mortar local school because the environment's different. So right, IEPs are largely based on the environment. Um, you know, the, the needs of the child in that environment. So if your environment changes, your needs are going to change a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get a little bit further. Um, and then the last way is independently. So uh, currently I'm homeschooling independently, um, but I could go to my, and I don't, but I could go to my local school district and request an IEP because schools are still required to provide IEPs to any student in their catchment, in their district. Um, so, but we've decided we didn't want to deal with our school district anymore, so we didn't. Um, I will also say that if you do do that, that may look a little bit different because even though they're required to provide an IEP to students, they're not required to, to provide the same amount of services. So you might see a drop in services if you, in, if you homeschool independently. Um, going back to the first two things, since you have control as an independent homeschooler, you might not need an IEP. I mean, I could, I could technically write one up myself and have it in my sort of my district, my personal schools file, but I haven't really needed to. I just do what needs to be done and make the accommodations, the modifications my son needs. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about those in a few minutes. You can also use your health insurance or your state department of disability or private pay to get therapies. So those are some ways. Um, Danielle, you want to add anything about maybe how you got services or an IEP if you did? Um, Andrew was in first steps and then at age three, he was to transfer into the local school district. And to do that, he would have gotten on a school bus at 7.45 in the morning and they would have dropped him off at almost 5.30 because our school is so far away. So I'm independent also. Um, that wasn't an acceptable day for me, for my three-year-old. And when I said, I'm just going to homeschool, they were dead silent on the other end. And I said, oh, don't worry. I homeschooled two others. They're not in jail. And one is valedictorian in college. So I think I did okay. <laughs> okay. So we're independent also. We get therapies through health insurance and through um, the, uh, his aid in Indiana. Um, one thing I did just before we move on is when I started homeschooling, and many people do this, um, they might start through a charter school because like for me, I felt a little secure because I knew I had something kind of backing me. I wasn't completely confident in myself. Um, and I also wanted those services. So for the first four years that we homeschooled, we did go through a, a, a charter school so that I could get my IEP um, and services. Um, and then we, you know, I got tired of having to follow their rules and um, stuff like that. And so that's when I switched to independent. So um, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about benefits of homeschooling, but that's kind of one of them is like, you can change what works one year, you know, might not work the next year. I don't think there's anything wrong with any of them. It's, it's worked. It's all individualized for each family and for each child and what the parents are comfortable with. Exactly. Um, and so then here's some, and you know, don't worry about trying to remember all these because I'm going to give the um, slides to Stacy so she can send them out to everybody who's here. Um, but these are some informal options for therapy. Um, some books on here, some websites. There's plenty more. This is just a sample sort of, of my favorite ones. Um, but so these books have ideas on like movement breaks that you can take and ways to actually teach some of the things that your physical therapist and your occupational therapist are doing. Um, Funderoo and Fun and Function have great, um, 
you know, tools, sensory tools, equipment, um, and they're inexpensive. This is, this is not expensive stuff. Super Duper Inc. has lots of good um, publications. They have lots of flashcards and stuff that are good for um, learning emotions, um, learning uh, analogies, learning, you know, like there's a picture of raining cats and dogs. And what does that really mean? Things like that. So these are, again, some of my favorite websites, um, but there's plenty more. If you start going, if you start looking at some of these, you know, if you search for some of these, you'll probably find other similar ones, but these are a good group of references. So then how do you choose curriculum? Well, um, things to consider. And by the way, are you guys seeing the top of the screen or is my little bar blocking that? Okay, Danielle, can yeah, you see this? Okay. Things to consider. Okay, so you can see all. Okay, on my screen, I'm getting the little control panel up there. And so I'm like, is it blocking everybody? <laughs> so how do we choose um, curriculum? It's funny because I can remember having friends over and they learned that we were homeschooling and they're like, yeah, but how do you pick curriculum? How do you get it? And I just, I, I literally grabbed a stack of catalogs of various curricula and I'm like, um, here, there's no shortage. So there is no shortage of being able to find curriculum. Um, things you want to be aware of, though, is you want to look at the requirements of your state or school district, because certain subjects may be required, um, particularly as you get into like high school. Um, and particularly if you think you might go back to a public school versus continuing to homeschool. Some virtual charter schools might have specific options or restrictions for the biggest restriction is if you are with a charter school, they will not pay for uh, religious curriculum because they're a public school. That's a, a contradiction. Doesn't mean you it doesn't mean you can't teach um, religious curriculum. It just won't be paid for by the charter school and won't be you can't use those in like your work samples. Um, another thing to think about when you're choosing your curriculum is your child's learning style. And one of my favorite um, books on this is The Way They Learn by Cynthia Ulrich to Tobias. Um, talks about the different learning styles and it's a pretty easy read and gives you a good kind of handle. There's lots of other things. Um, if, you, if you Google, you know, find my child's learning style, it'll come up with a bunch of different things. And it's helpful though, because some, you know, some kids learn best by watching videos. Some learn best by hands-on um, learning. Some do great with workbooks and textbooks. It, so you've got to find what works best for your child. Um, your child's interests and strengths, and this kind of goes along with their learning style. These two are definitely related. Um, Kathy Duffy Reviews is one of my favorite resources on this. She has this website, and then she also has a a book. I kind of like the book because I like to be able to page through things, but the website has, you know, more up-to-date information. And you can probably find this book at your li local library too, if you just want to um, check it out and go through there. It, what I like about it is both the website and the book talk about the different curriculums and they talk about what kind of learner does best with them. So, um, I've always used it as a good resource. And then, of course, your budget. Um, if you're doing, in, if you're homeschooling independently, it's all on you. You're paying for everything yourself. And you can do a completely 100% free curriculum. Or you can spend, you know, over $1,000 per student for a, what they call a boxed curriculum set, which includes everything. So, um, you know, how much do you have to spend can influence that. Danielle, you have anything you want to add on on this? And um, I think it's important to realize, too, that if a curriculum doesn't work, you can change it even mid-year. That's an excellent point and something that I struggled with. Did I mention I was a type A personality? So when I started, I was like, OK, I bought this. I got to stick with it. It's important um, to fill in all the blanks yeah. <laughs> and do <it> every yeah, day. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I learned that, uh, no, we don't have to fill in all the blanks. You don't have to do all the pages. And if, like Danielle said, if something's not working, you can change it. Um, we, the, and now I've done that. <laughs> the, the fight 
if there's tears and fighting and it's not working out, there's something wrong. And in first grade, spelling was our tearful subject. Um, surprisingly, it wasn't math. But um, he didn't understand the concept of spelling. He could read, he could do the phonics. Um, we did a lot of whole language reading. But um, finally, I just quit. I was like, this isn't worth it anymore. We're not doing spelling. I just, I, I took the book and I buried it in another room. And we didn't look at spelling until second grade. And the mom and me was like, oh my gosh, I'm ruining my kid. There's, you know, this is not gonna work. But then when we started it in second grade, he did the entire first grade spelling book in like two and a half months. It was like the brain wasn't mature. It wasn't ready yet. Um, there was a delay that I didn't understand. But just by taking it away and reintroducing it, it worked. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point because I hear this a lot in my homeschool community about, you know, people, I can remember one friend who was worried because their child wasn't reading and just had no interest, wasn't reading. And, you know, she was like, and she was an unschooler. So she was very loose about it, but she started getting really worried. And then a couple of years later, I mean, he was just reading like nonstop because she let him grow into it. And this is not a special needs child. This was just a child who wasn't ready to read yet. And you'll see that a lot where kids just, sometimes they're just not ready and schools often, because they have their set curriculum and what has to be done by, you know, this year, and this, you know, milestone, they, they push things that, you know, kids may not be ready for, but, and then they resent it. But if they're allowed to come to things in their own terms, they'll do better and have a, a greater love of that subject or that, um, you know, lesson. Right. So. And I think curriculum can be overwhelming for a lot of families. I just worked with one family um, and that was the first thing they said was, well, what curriculum do I use? And and it's like, well, before you even think about curriculum and this is a whole picture, first of all, break it down. What are your goals? What do you want to teach this year? You have a first grader. Do they read yet? Do they not read yet? Do you want to do, you know, what kind of math do you have? You know, like, so you just plan your goals out first and then that curriculum just sort of fell into place. And then after, you know, and I just, I had to keep saying Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not just going to go out and buy all of the curriculum that you need in the course of an hour. And it's okay to start school with just a math book and a spelling book. The rest of it comes into place and you kind of learn to navigate through it. Yep. Um, so here's also continuing on where to get curriculum. Um, some in-person resources. I love homeschool conferences. I just love conferences. I'm one of those people who I could go to any conference on any subject and have a good time because I just like to learn. Um, but one of my favorite things is that the large um, conferences, they'll usually have big vendor halls where you can look through, you can actually thumb through all the books and talk to the companies. It can be, I will also warn you, it can be very overwhelming but it is a great place to see everything hands-on mm -hmm. and involve your child. I've been to, you know, the conferences and I've taken Ryan through the vendor halls and I've already narrowed down my choices, right? We don't want to give unlimited choices. And I've already, you know, got my like my top two or three picks for a subject. And then I'll take him around and have him look at the stuff and help me pick which one he wants. Um, some conferences have big used curriculum sales, which is another great place, um, particularly if you know what you're looking for, um, you might be able to pick up a bargain. Homeschool park days or learning centers. Um, at park days, some of, sometimes we've got families who are giving away curriculum that they're done with. So that's a great way to pick up stuff. Um, it's also just a great way to talk to people about what they're using and what's worked and what didn't work, what they like, what they didn't like. Um, some park days or learning centers have, again, used curriculum sales or online marketplaces where you can get deals on things. Um, some learning centers have stores. There's a there's a really good learning center not too far from me that they have got a great store with lots of curriculum and excellent experienced um, homeschool parents who run the, the center that will answer all your questions on the curriculum too that they have there. So it's, it's a great place. 
your local library. You know, again, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can use books at the library. Sometimes they actually have textbooks if you want that. But there's lots of learning that can be done just as, you know, out of regular books, exploring their, you know, their interests. Um, local bookstores, if you've noticed, Barnes and Nobles, even Staples and Office Depot have sections now with, you know, flashcards and workbooks and, you know, things like that. Lakeshore Learning is one of my favorite mm -hmm. um, places. And there's a couple other, I, I put Lakeshore Learning on here because that's national, I think. And so I think pretty much every state has one. Um, but there's, a, there's other local stores like Lakeshore Learning that just have a ton of manipulatives and games um, and workbooks. And, you know, again, hands-on stuff, depending on what works best for your child. Danielle, do you have any other places or any of your favorites out of this list of? Um, I love Lakeshore Learning. It's, it's a little pricey, but sometimes you can look at what they've got and you can like create your own. <laughs> Um, or they have coupons. They have. I always go there and buy stuff for my coupons. <laughs> oh, see, we don't have a store. My closest store is up in Michigan. It's about six hours away. So I've I've never been to a store, but I I go through their website all the time. Oh, Danielle, it's heaven. I have I have two at least in a good you know like within a half hour of me, and it's like that I'd like would be scary. I store. would have to build that into my monthly, maybe my weekly budget. <laughs> I do not go often. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can just Google um, a teacher's store, like an educational store. We've got uh, my local one moved. It's now about an hour and a half away. But if I needed something, I wouldn't hesitate driving there. So then here's some, um, a list of online places. And some of these are free or low cost. Some of these are, you know, more money. Um, Brain Pop has a free um, portion, but then they also have a paid portion. Um, it's kind of fun learning via games. Ellis Fongo is a collection of short video lessons. Khan Academy has, is free and it has a bunch of great lessons on subjects. Teachers Pay Teachers is kind of what it sounds like. It's teachers who have done lesson plans and maybe worksheets and things like that and you pay a little bit of money but then you can like download and print out their stuff um, these other one the homeschooler homeschool buyers co-op does it it's the you know power of of multiple purchasers so they'll you know Danielle wants to buy this. I want to buy this. We've got 10 other moms who want to buy this. And so now that there's 15 of us, you know, buying this curriculum, we can buy it at a cheaper price. Um, so they'll have deals. Um, so these are just, again, not include, you know, there's plenty more. This is just a sample of kind of popular ones, ones that I kind of like. Um, Lecture learning is also online as well as in person. So, um, and then... So why should I homeschool? So my number one reason, and we've, we've hinted at this a little bit, both Danielle and I in, in our comments, my number one reason is flexibility. Um, time of day, you can start school as early as you want or as late. I am a night owl, so I am not up early. We start school late in my house. It works for us. The length of day. Um, lessons at home, remember, are going to be completed a lot faster than at school. So don't think that you've got to be doing lessons from, you know, eight o'clock to three o'clock. Mm. Particularly if they're younger, it's only going to take, you know, an hour or two. Um, or if you have a child who needs lots of breaks because they can only do little snippets because their intention span is short, then you can stretch your day out, but you're not doing lessons that whole time. You're, you know, maybe you do a 20 minute lesson and then you play outside for an hour or you, you know, clean their room or do whatever. And then you come back and do another 20 minute lesson or a half hour lesson. And then you take another you know, break for lunch or whatever. The point is, you've got the control, you've got the flexibility. Mm 
days of the week. Do you want to do a four day week and have a, you know, maybe that fifth day is for museum day or park day or just a chore day. Do you want to do lessons on the weekend? You, you can do it. Where you do lessons, Danielle mentioned this uh, earlier, where um, maybe you want to, you, you know, sitting at a desk is not for everybody. I am actually, and I know I'm in a little tiny window because I'm sharing, but if I'm actually in our classroom, I am sitting on the couch, a little we use um, to do our lessons. We don't sit at a desk. Um, so you might want to, you know, lay on the floor, read outside, jumping on a trampol trampoline and do math facts or vocabulary words. Um, you know, it's whatever works. Um, and the, for our kids with, you know, special needs, the ability to make accommodations and modifications, you know, what's better than that? So maybe somebody in the chat because I think you guys are all muted at the moment. Um, somebody just name an accommodation that their child has at um, school. And I'll put, I'll, while waiting for somebody to give me an example, I'll give you one. Sometimes um, I've seen in IEPs like that the student needs to be at the front of the classroom, right? So that they can, you know, they don't get distracted. Well, there's no front of the classroom, right? It's just you and the, the child, or, you know, even if you've, if you've got multiple kids, it might be you and their siblings, but you don't need that um, accommodation anymore because you're naturally making it. Um, you know, you might have accommodation of, you know, them having a, a special place to go um, if they're having a meltdown. Well, I'm sure most of us probably already have that in our house, right? So you don't need that. You don't need to make that a special accommodation. You already have naturally built that into your house, into your into your routine. So um, again, flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Um, chunking work. So chunking work um, would actually, Stacy, would it be actually more of a modification versus a accommodation? You can unmute yourself if you want to. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's something, again, that you can do at home. Go ahead, Stacey. I saw you unmuted yourself. Oh, yes, I was going to say it is um, more of a modification. Yeah. But, you know, and that works, too. So, um, you know, some modifications, and thank you, because I actually do have on here that you can make the modifications as well. Um, chunking work, um, you know, only doing odd number of questions on a worksheet. Um, you know, all of those are things that you don't need somebody to spell out for you anymore because you can do it. And you can, and you have the flexibility to make changes in that. So if one day they can do all the questions on the worksheet, great. If the next day you can see that they're just not in it, okay, let's do the front side of this. Let's do, you know, half of this if you see I mean we've done you know, we rearrange the order we do lessons in depending on what our the rest of our schedule looks like for the day um, if you know if we have an appointment we have to go somewhere we know we're not going to have time to finish that lesson that we normally do first we switch it up um, or you know we've taken breaks because it's like okay we are not focused today so this is not gonna work um, Danielle, I'm sure you've got lots to say about flexibility. So jump right um, in. Andrew, we, at first I would like just sit on Andrew's side when he was younger and we would just go through everything that we needed to go through. And there were days when, you know, everybody has good days and everybody has bad days. Good days, you really get a lot done and unfo un unfocused days, you just don't fight it. Um, but then I started what we called our work bins. It's a stack of drawers and I labeled them like math, spelling, um, language, history, whatever our subjects were. And all of his schoolwork stays in those drawers. That's our organization. And then on there, I have this strip that tells it's Monday through Friday and it tells him what needs to be done on each day. And he goes in and he likes to start at 6 a.m. This kid is up 
every morning at six, doesn't matter what time zone we're in, it's always six o'clock Eastern time. Um, and he starts his work drawers and he goes through and if he's got a, he, there's stickers that he, or Velcros that he moves over when the drawer is done. So he sees he can move on to the next one. He's done with all his independent work by seven, seven thirty, And then we eat and then I go down and we go over all of it and we work on what he didn't understand if he had any questions or sometimes I'll teach something new for the following day. So we kind of got that teaching him to be independent in his schoolwork down. So, and every family's different. So, um, can I work and homeschool? So, I the short answer is yes. Um, it does take more planning, but it's absolutely possible. Um, so a lot of it will depend on how flexible is your job. Can you do lessons before or after work, depending on you know, what your schedule is, or maybe on the weekend? Um, can somebody else help you during work hours? And, oops, I jumped ahead. Um, I'll let Danielle talk about work and homeschooling before we talk about our next topic. Uh, I had a flexible job. Um, so when my kids had soccer games or whatever, I was able to kind of work my airline job around it and I could be home. Sometimes I couldn't. Mostly I was just never home on the holidays. Like Christmas to us was not the 25th. It, Christmas can happen on any day. That's just the way an airline family works. Um, so three days a week, I knew pretty much knew I was going to be gone. And we just moved school to the weekends. And then, and now with the website, I have it so that my business hours are from like six to seven thirty, and from eight o'clock to midnight. That's just because you know, that just works for us. And I'll go back to something I said earlier, which is when you're homeschooling, it generally takes a lot less time than when they're actually in school. When so, you think about a classroom with 20, 30 kids in it, they have to stand in line, go to the bathroom, they have to stand in line to get a drink of water. You know, they, they walk in a line to the lunchroom or they have, you know, set recesses and breaks and then they work all those in between and, and they have to, you have to keep up with the other 20. Whereas in homeschool, if we don't move on until you understand it, you know, if it takes three weeks to understand what adding is, then so be it. It's not worth moving on unless you have that strong foundation. But because we don't have all that wait time and waiting for everybody else, we're pretty much done with school by noon. You know, it, it only takes us a couple hours and Andrew does his, you know, his independent stuff. Yep. Um, and then of course, the number one question or one of the number one questions is what about socialization? Um, so let's take a look at the definition of socialization first. So the dictionary says, that socialization is the activity of mixing socially with others or the process of learning to behave in a way that is acceptable to society. So think about this. Do you think that school is necessary to accomplish those? Do you think that this is the goal of school? Because the goal of school isn't to teach kids how to um, mix socially with others or you know, the way to behave in a way that's acceptable to society. School is there to teach them the lessons and to teach them to sit still and wait their turn, and which not saying that those are bad things, but that's not necessarily socialization, the way I think about it. Um, and I, my concern was the negative aspects. I didn't want my kid learning all the bad habits at school. Um, and particularly the vulnerability of our kids that have special needs and what's happening to them. Um, I find that, the, at least in my area, the homeschooling community is much more accepting of a wide range of people. Um, because it's just, it's just sort of the, in the embrace of like being different. Um, and so, you know, I just don't find and not to say that there aren't, you know, everything's perfect, but I just think that those incidents happen less. Plus, you're usually around to help intervene and to make sure that those, you know, no negative things are happening. Um, 
And so there's also plenty of places and opportunities to get socialization outside school. Homeschool park day groups. Um, and by the way, homeschool park day groups usually will meet once a week, maybe once every other week, kind of depends on what your park school um, group does. But they'll often organize field trips and games and things like that. So lots of things there. Classes at learning centers or at libraries, uh, the YMCA, things like that. Ryan takes classes at uh, learning centers near us. So um, he, he doesn't do a lot. We do most of our stuff at home, but he kind of takes some extracurricular stuff, um, you know, electives, if you will, at some of these learning centers. And then he's in a small group, you know, class setting. So he learns some of that, you know, wait your turn, be in a class kind of stuff. Um, 4-H, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you know, any sort of club activities like that. Church groups, Special Olympics or other sports groups. Some schools will let homeschoolers participate in their team sports. That varies from district to district and sometimes even school to school, but it is possible. Um, real life, okay, right? Real life socialization. Our, Ryan goes to the bank with me. He's seen me open up accounts. Um, you know, he goes to the store with me. Um, he's gone to the post office. He, you know, he goes to meetings with me. He, you know, he is out in the world in real, you know, how you and I socialize with the world. Um, and then there's also social skills therapy groups. So um, I often said to people when they ask me this question, I'm like, we would never have time for lessons if I took advantage of all the opportunities for socialization. You have to save because, time for school. Yeah, <laughs> because there's, you know, there's just so many opportunities for kids to be to, together outside of school and, ha and have those interactions. So there's, you know, there's plenty of ways to socialize. Um, and with that, unless, do you have anything to add on socialization before we finish up here and go to questions? I think the only way you would be unsocialized is if you never left your house, which going to the grocery store can be considered socialization. You know, a Andrew knows everybody's name at Home Depot and Aldi, and they all know him. And when he walks into Aldi, they give him little jobs. He'll go run and pick up all the empty boxes. And so, I mean, it all adds up. I mean, I always look at it like this too. You know, they're they're kids for you know just a short time, and then they're going to be adults for the rest of their life. And so, all these real life things are really where they're going to spend their time. And obviously, our kids are going to be a little bit different, but but we still need to. I think Danielle, one of the things was like riding a bus, right? Learning how to ride a bus was that one of the things that Stacy mentioned in the in your intro. Um, but just you know, those practical things; those are oh, things yes. that are. Pump of gas. I, I knew yeah. it was something. Yeah. <laughs> Transportation. Kind of life, life, life skills. Right. Exactly. Life skills. I mean, that's that's what our kids need. Um, so we're going to go to questions. And I know that there's some here in the box. So I'm going to start. I've been with... typing on some. It was really hard to listen and like answer <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> we'll, I'm we'll, a multitasker, we'll but I guess I couldn't split my brain very well to answer everything <laughs> all at once. <laughs> All right, so the first question I have here on the list is, if you begin with independent homeschooling and then transfer to a public charter or private school, can you get an IEP at any age um, if and when they start school or do they get one now and then revise as you go? Um, it can be either. Um, so any school, so if if you start out independent and then you you know transfer into a school, they still are obligated. They have to give you that IEP. If um, you know, if you say, "Hey, my child needs an IEP," they have to do an assessment, and then you know, you go from the assessment to to determine what services and modifications, accommodations are needed. Um, and so, at any age, at any time, uh, I mean, honestly, any kid in public school at any time, you know. So maybe you know, let's our kids who we know have a diagnosis already. If I have a child who I don't know has any, you know, any diagnosis and then, you know, sixth grade, 
I suddenly realized that maybe this child has dyslexia or, you know, something like that, I can request an IEP evaluation at that time. So just because you start out independent does not mean, um, does not preclude you from later getting an IEP. Um, the second part of that was, or do they get one now and then revise as you go? IEPs are always going to be uh, reviewed and revised. So if you have one, um, they're, they're supposed to be done every year. Um, and then you have your triennial where every three years you do a bigger uh, reevaluation um, and, and change things up. So for those, um, so you could, you could do that same. You could go to your school district, um, get your IEP, and revise as you need to. Um, so I hope that answered that one, Christina. Um, next on here is about how the testing works. So testing largely depends, and Danielle's typing an answer to that one. <laughs> I, was, so. I was typing, but it's easier to talk about it, isn't it, than to type it. <laughs> um, so on testing, that depends on how you homeschool. Um, if you're with your local school district through their independent study program or with a charter school, you will have to do the same testing that the, that that school district does. So that's, you know, whatever your state testing is, um, you'll have to do that. They, for homeschool kids, they'll have them go to, um, usually it's like, you know, a church or some public, a library or, you know, some sort of public um, place where they will do the, the testing with a proctor. Um, you can also do testing at home. Um, there's a couple of, and I, I, the name escapes me, there's a, but there's a testing, I think it's called the California Achievement Test, which is not California-based. It just happens to be called that. Um, that is an assessment that you can do at home if you, like if you were independent and then, but you kind of wanted to know how they're doing, you know, on a standardized test, just so you have an idea, you can use that. So there, uh, and that's only one um, testing company. I'm trying to see if I have a book over here. I might have the book. I'll find that and, and include that when I give Stacy the, the slides, but there are ways to do testing. Um, so hopefully that answered that. And then let's see, um, for your PWS child, do you just use a mainstream curriculum or is there a special stream of curriculum that you may accommodate them? So I use regular um, curriculum. Um, there's most homeschool curriculum is not, you know, there's not really a special needs curriculum. Some um, companies will say that this is good for kids with special needs, but it's not, you know, limited just to special needs kids. So it's really just finding the best curriculum for your student, whatever their needs are. And you're going to have, you know, like anyone, most of our kids with PWS have strengths and weaknesses. So that's another benefit. And that flexibility of homeschooling is maybe your child is ahead in one subject and behind in another subject. And you can, you know, do different grade levels for different subjects mm -hmm. because that's where their need is and that's where their skills are. I think for practical purposes, when somebody looks at Andrew and says, what grade are you in? I, you know, I actually don't know a homeschool kid that doesn't look at their parent when somebody asks them that because they really don't know. Right. They could be doing college classes and, in, in, you know, classes two years younger than where they really are. Um, but I just, I've trained him just to say ninth grade because it's just easier to answer. But um, he's all over the place. Like he, we, we, he's done ninth grade biology already. We're moving on. I'm not, you know, we're moving on to 10th grade. But math, there's just, math is difficult. And um, sometimes that concept can be very abstract. Like he did, he's done great in division, but all of a sudden we've moved on to double digit dividing. And it's like starting a whole new math concept for him. So last year I hung it up, this year we're gonna reintroduce it. Um, so I don't, I never, we're really, we really don't go by grades. 
when we go by, you know, what we want to accomplish and like really college is probably not what we're working towards. If he wanted to, that's fine, but um, I don't see that happening. So really, what is it that we're working for? We're working for a good work ethic, um, how to work with people, how to follow directions. And we're kind of getting at that age now to where it's not just about spelling words and doing this and doing that. He's a great writer. Um, I have him write, I've had, I've had him write some things for the, for the website. Um, so I think grades, grades really, you can follow a grade, but you don't have to stay in that grade if they don't get it. Cause there's just no point in moving on to, you know, trigonometry if they can't divide yet. Right. So, yeah. So, so back to that, it's just whatever curriculum works for your child. Mm -hmm. Um, and Christina, you also mentioned that a ha handwriting without tears, handwriting without tears, everybody loves that. Like homeschoolers love that. Um, I think a lot of schools use that. It is a great program. Um, and you're saying if they can hold their, their pencil probably. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a big thing with our kids, right? Um, is there any, is, is there an online where they can use their hand or something else until they can? So what I did, um, writing was a struggle for my son initially. So he went to public kindergarten and writing was one of those issues where the, the teacher kept saying, well, he's not writing properly. And I'm like, yeah, so what? He's going to get there. I wasn't worried. I brought him home. And this is similar to Danielle's story about um, the spelling. So I brought Ryan home, started homeschooling him in first grade. And I didn't make him he was really good at spelling so we did spelling but he couldn't physically do the writing right he was having a really hard time with that but I let him just dictate um, when we used little magnetic um, letters and so he would actually spell them out either dic either just dictating to me or using those little letter tiles so that's another way or typing once they get you know once they get old enough to actually use a computer, they can type or use an iPad or whatever. So there are other ways to help them communicate um, in, you know, writing, practice those sort of skills without the physical writing because it will come. And then what happened with Ryan was one day he just said, oh, I think I can write my spelling words now. And I went, great, handed him the pencil. He started writing his spelling words after that. But it was because I gave him the time, kind of like Danielle mentioned with, with the spelling words and just not being able, you know, um, her son struggling with that. She put it aside for a while. I took the pressure off Ryan to write until he was ready. Mm -hmm. um, so we did, uh, we did a lot of hand strengthening stuff, Play-Doh. Um, I try, I have a million pencil grips in the house yet from all the different ones that I tried. And ultimately then I, I kept, I mean, we kept the pencil as part of it. I didn't really care what came out from the other end of the pencil, but then we used shaving cream on a cookie tray and he loved to write in that with his finger. You know, all of a sudden it was writing, but it wasn't having to grip a pencil or taking a baggie, a double lined baggie and um, putting just a little bit of tempera paint in it. Um, and, and they can write their letters in that paint um, through the baggie. So it, it was it was writing. It just wasn't with a pencil. And it wasn't like the pencil left the schoolroom. It was still there. I just didn't care what came out of the pencil. Um, Stacy, I'm going to ask you a question because I don't know. Can everybody see the questions and the answers? So the ones that Danielle's answered? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. So then I won't repeat those, but I will. Um, and I guess, Stacy, you might have to let people unmute themselves if they want to ask a question. Yes, I can do that right now. Um, I'd also like to ask Danielle to add her website into the chat so people can check that out as well. Oh, okay. And I will say, I'm going to answer one of these questions too. And I think one of the reasons why Danielle and I wanted to do this together is we wanted to emphasize the point that homeschooling is not one size fits all. So what works in her house might be different than what works in my house. And the beauty is finding what works in your house. 
So one of the questions on here that um, Danielle already answered was about um, locking everything and how, you know, how would it be having a PWS kiddo at home with the kitchen? So our setup is the kitchens at, and we don't have a very big house, <laughs> Um, but the kitchen is like kind of at one side and our classroom is at the other, just by the way the house is set up. Our classroom's at the other side. And so I'm always kind of in between. If I'm not in the classroom with Ryan, then I'm in the living room, which is right next to the kitchen. So I'm, I'm sort of that built in like barrier. Um, so you can't get to it. And then I'm going to, um, and I'm going to, again, kind of go along with what Danielle said here on the question about participating in a local co-op. We do, um, we don't do a co-op. We do do learning centers. And Ryan has taken several different classes at, we've been to at least three, no, four different learning centers through, through the years. Um, and it's, I kind of describe the learning centers as like community college, but for kids, because it's like you look at the schedule and you decide what class you want to take. And they're generally, most of them are once a week classes. Um, and he goes into the classes and he's fine. I've always sort of prepped the teacher ahead of time with, you know, any special needs or any concerns I have, but then I'm always there like on campus, um, if, you know, if a problem arises, um, but I think it's a great way to, to give yourself a little bit of a break too, because I would be able to do emails or read a book or whatever, or visit with a friend in the hall while Ryan was in class. Um, and then we do park day. Um, so we don't go every week. Our park day, our park group meets once a week, but we don't typically go every week because we're busy. Um, but we participate through a book club with them, um, which is, again, another socialization aspect. Uh, and we talked about uh, um, different grade levels there. Just work at whatever your child, you know, whatever works for your child. So, all right. So did we have anybody else that wanted to pop in and ask a question? So if not, then... Oh, there is uh, a question in the Q&A that just popped in. Okay. Um, so no. So the question is, were you able to participate in all these social things during COVID? Um, yes and no. Our Park Day group went virtual, um, which didn't work so well for Park Day because, you know, the kids are trying to play around. But we did... Um, we did continue the book groups actually through Zoom and that did work. And we even did the youngest group, um, our homeschool park day, they do different age groups, uh, you know, book clubs and the youngest group, like the read to read to me. So like the six and under, they did not continue because it's hard to get little kids on Zoom, but the other groups did. They continued via Zoom, and Ryan's social skills group has continued via Zoom. Our Park Day group just started going back just this, no, in July. We just started going back in July. Um, so we're, we're slowly getting back to that. Um, so there are ways, and some people created bubbles. I know that some homeschooling families would have like a bubble with, you know, another family or two, just like, you know, kind of non-homeschooling families created bubbles and would be able to get together with, you know, other families that way. So, you know, everything is possible. You just have to, you know, you just make it work. Um, so Danielle, anything you want to say to wrap things up? Um, I really think you did a great job and I love the questions here. I think it's just a matter of breaking it down into goals and looking at what you want to do. And you know what, if, well, I, I, and I told other families, if homeschooling doesn't work out, you can always go back, you know, and odds are is you're, you're probably going to enjoy it and find that it's a whole lot more relaxed 
Um, I cringe when I see some of the people online who have like food issues with parties and teachers who give everybody cupcakes, but your kid doesn't get one. And I don't have any of that to deal with. It's just so much more relaxed. Um, yeah, same. I, I just had a friend who was talking about, because they started, their school district started back to, to school this week and talked about the, um, the drop-off line. And I just thought, oh, don't have to deal with that. Never have. <laughs> you know? um, and, you know, while I'm out of my pajamas, you know, and everybody else is lining up for school and I'm, you know, just waking up. Um, yeah, and one of the things that I really love is watching my son learn and knowing what he's learning. And honestly, I have to say, I've learned a lot myself. Like, mm -hmm. history was never a subject that I personally liked in school. It just wasn't my thing. I, you know, I, I know I took history, <laughs> um, but I feel like I've learned a lot more doing it with him um and you know and then I like to just apply things we get to we have these wonderful conversations you know like bird paths if you will where he might ask a question while we're doing a lesson or we might be out at a museum or you know at the park or at the store or wherever and something comes up and I'll and I'll reference it back to a lesson that we've talked about um, and so it's like tying that into like real life. Um, I, I, you know, I just think it's, it's great. Um, and I will say homeschooling is not for everybody. Um, I think it's certainly possible for almost everybody. Um, and I think that any, one of the questions I always ask Ryan when he's coming to me and he's got some sort of problem, I can tell he's anxious. I always go, what's your concern? Because I'm trying to get to the root of what's bothering him. And so I would say that to you if you're saying, oh, I, I couldn't possibly homeschool. That wouldn't work. I would, I would ask you, what's your concern? So what do you think the barrier is? Because I bet you there's a solution to that. Because I, I really do honestly feel like anybody can homeschool. Um, you just have to get by what you think your concern is and break that barrier down because Sometimes I think it's your own negative thinking too that um kind of breaks it down for you the, the thought process that I can do this um I had somebody a couple of weeks ago it was like the same thing and I said but I don't think that's the real what's the real issue here and they said I don't want to ruin their life and it's like why how would you do that this is your child like you want you know them better than anybody else on earth. You want the best for them more than anybody else on earth. How could you do that? <laughs> and, and by the time we got done, they were like, I, I think it's my own thought process. I'm afraid, what if I screw up? And it's like, you screw up every day. I do as soon as I put my feet on the floor from getting out of bed, like it just, that's just the way life is. But you work through it, you know what you want for them. And, and yeah, you just, you know, some days, are really rough. And then there's other days that it's like, wow, I really enjoy doing this. And I think that I'd be more concerned by with a parent who wasn't worried about screwing up than with the parents who are worried about, you know, messing up because that, you know, as parents, we want to do the best by our kids and, you know, having that thought of, uh Oh, what if I make a mistake or what if I do something wrong is showing your conscientious and you're probably not going to make a mistake because if you do, it's not going to be something that's, you know, really going to ruin them. Parental um, guilt is always there. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you do. Um, we had an obsession online with a subject that took a dark corner and I didn't like it. And so I just cut out all electronics. And then, then it was kind of like, well, you know, then I have that parental guilt. He's not learning internet research skills. He's not learning this. But as soon as I let him on the internet, we start going to, you know, like we're, we're totally obsessed with, you know, America's most wanted and crime and how it's happening and the murders in Cincinnati. And it was like, I, yeah, I can't handle this anymore. So that has to go away or I have to be sitting next to you. We can't do this. But that parental guilt's always there no matter what you do. <laughs> I will also say this to uh, just as a follow up to, to kind of some things that we've saying and some of 
the questions. Um, you can go in and out between homeschooling and school. So, you know, I know people in my homeschooling community who like, you know, one year their kid went to school and the next year they homeschooled and, you know, they kind of go in and out as, as they needed to. Um, it is harder once they get to high school because it's harder to, to prove that you've met the requirements. Not impossible, but harder. So just keep that in mind. Um, it is possible to homeschool all the way through um, high school. Um, Danielle's done it with her two older ones. I'm going to start Ryan's senior year this year. Um, I am keeping him to what our high school graduation requirements would be. I looked, as I mentioned in one of the early slides, I looked at what our state requirements are. I looked at our local school district and we are sticking to those things. I make modifications and accommodations, um, but he is doing all the, that curriculum, you know, my picking, but those subjects, the lessons that are required, he is doing that. Um, if you think that you have a college bound student, and I know not all of our kids are college bound, but some are, um, you can homeschool, issue a diploma, you know, if you're independent or through your charter school and they can go to college. So don't, you know, let that, don't think that homeschooling would prevent them from going on, on to college if that is something that you think is possible for your I child just, to desire. I discovered with my older two, um, like creating college transcripts. I did a lot of research on how to do that and what to do. And as much as I don't like our county school district, um, the counselor was really helpful. They they were they and they were amazed at what we accomplished. I mean, we had sailing, we had, um, you know, we had all the calculus done and the physics and everything that they needed to do for college entrance, um, including note taking. And and they were like, well, what's that? And I said, well, most homeschoolers don't have to sit in a class and take notes. So we would do a history program. It would be like, okay, here's your notebook. You got to take notes. You know, and then we would go through that, and that was how they learned to take notes before they got to college. But um, your school district can still be very helpful, even if you're you're schooling. And then there are some families who want nothing to do with their school district. Right. Um, so I put up our email addresses here for you. And last year I wrote a series of articles on homeschooling, which are on the website. That link should actually take you to all seven of them. Um, and that's it. So thank you for coming and, you know, reach out to Danielle and I, oh, and I also wanted to say, I've got the right name here. Danielle created a Facebook group, um, called Prodder Willie Syndrome Homeschooling Network. So if you're on Facebook and want to, um, look for that group that she created, then do that. That's a great, you know, talking to other homeschool parents is a great way just to get information. And again, to make, to, you know, just like we need that support in our, our PWS community of, am I doing the right thing? Am I messing up my child? Am I forgetting something? Like we have all those same concerns in the homeschooling community. Um, and so it's, you know, find your homeschooling community in your area and, um, you know, bond with them, ask them questions, pick the brains of, you know, the veteran homeschoolers there and, you know, find your community, but it's possible. You can do it. <laughs> Please, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, really, really great. Enjoyed it. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate yeah. it. Oh, you're thank very you welcome. Us. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.